honored colleagues and friends. On behalf of the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists, it is my privilege to welcome you to the Muriel Driver Memorial Lecture. This award recognizes the outstanding contribution of an individual from within the profession in the fields of research, teaching, and practice of occupational therapy. Chers collègues et amis, au nom de l'Association canadienne des ergothérapeutes, j'ai l'honneur de vous accueillir au discours commémoratif Muriel Driver. Ce prix reconnaît la contribution exceptionnelle d'un individu au sein de la profession dans les domaines de la recherche, de l'enseignement et de la pratique de l'ergothérapie. This award was named in memory of Muriel Driver, a pioneer of occupational therapy who served in the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps and was posted to Europe during the Second World War. She was the first occupational therapist to work at the Hamilton Mil Military Hospital, and she organized the first Department of Occupational Therapy at Runnymede Hospital in Toronto, and much more. Muriel Driver's outstanding contribution to occupational therapy exemplifies the highest qualities of our profession. Dri Excuse me. We honor the memor <laughs> we honor the memory of Muriel Driver and her work by inviting our Muriel Driver Award recipients from the previous years to address conference delegates this year, providing a forum to share their own work as a recognized champion of the profession. There have been 38 Muriel Driver lecturers who have been honored with this memorial award and have been honored to walk in the footsteps, footsteps of Muriel Driver. We'd like to take a minute to acknowledge our past Muriel Driver Award recipients. Their names are on the screens. Several past recipients are here with us today, and I'd invite them to join me on stage and be recognized. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the past recipients of the Muriel Driver Memorial Award who are here with, uh, here with us in Charlottetown. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous présente les récipiendaires précédents du Muriel Driver qui sont ici avec nous à faire un merci. Please give, allow us to give one more recognition. <laughs> Big group. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Soon we're going to need a bigger stage for this honor. <laughs> Dr. Karen Wally Hamill is this year's lecturer. Dr. Wally Hamill's work is dedicated to making us think and encourages a deeper discourse on subjects that influence occupational therapy research and practice. Karen has worked as an occupational therapist for more than 30 years, making her mark in clinical practice, training, and the research and development of our theoretical foundations. Karen travaille à titre d'ergothérapeute depuis plus de 30 ans. Elle a eu un impact en pratique clinique, en formation et dans la recherche et le développement de nos fondements théoriques. As an author and publisher, she has exposed sensitive and relevant issues that invite occupational therapists to reflect, to think, and to question their certitudes. Two of Karen's colleagues, Drs. Catherine Vallée and Melinda Suto, are here to introduce Karen 
and to share with us the many reasons that compelled them to support her Muriel Driver Award nomination. I invite Catherine and Melinda onto the stage to introduce this year's honoree. Hello, I'm Melinda Sudo from the University of British Columbia. This is Catherine, um, the University of British Columbia's Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. I'm delighted to introduce you to my esteemed colleague and dear friend, Dr. Karen Wally Hamill. In the introduction, I'll touch on how relationships, places, and opportunities have influenced her. Dr. Catherine Vallée will conclude our introduction. Karen grew up in Stanmore at the edge of London, the daughter of Roma, a registered children's nurse, and Harry, a sociologist and director of social services in the borough of Brent. Karen melded her parents' professional interests in fostering health and in striving for social justice when she decided to study occupational therapy in Liverpool. After one year of work at Churchill Hospital in Oxford, Karen's desire for adventure led her to Canada. Her plan to stay for no more than a year vanished when Karen met Ike Hamill. They built a log home on the Hamill family ranch in the Souris River Valley near Oxbow, Saskatchewan, where they still live for half the year. For several years, Karen worked as a community occupational therapist in rural southeast Saskatchewan. The work was challenging, rewarding, and a continual learning experience. During these years, Karen received the Saskatchewan Society of Occupational Therapists awards both for outstanding contributions to the profession and to the community. After a decade of clinical practice, Karen returned to England temporarily to pursue a Master of Science degree at the University of Southampton. Exposed for the first time at Southampton to the work of the early British critical disability theorist, Karen had a heart-pounding eureka moment when the edgy ideas she was reading resonated with her own beliefs about disability arising from her clinical experiences. The challenge of these critical perspectives fired Karen's imagination. Having attained her MSc with distinction, Karen seized the opportunity to pursue her PhD at UBC with Ike's support and presence. Ike sustained a high spinal cord injury, and Karen defines caring as her most important role. But it is a role that is blended well with her love of writing, through which she expresses her passionate commitment to the occupational therapy profession. You'll hear more about that from Catherine in a moment. Karen is a fervent believer in the importance of occupation to health, well-being, and the experience of quality of life. Her life is enriched by time spent with Ike, close friends and special friends in Vancouver, close family and special friends in Vancouver, Oxbow, England, and Norway, by travels through more than 50 countries, by prolific reading, enjoying art and music, walking and snorkeling, but not at the same time, and by spending <laughs> tranquil days at the ranch with their horses. Catherine? Je vais m'adresser quelques mots aux francophones ou aux francophiles d'entre nous. Euh, J'ai choisi de ne pas faire la présentation de, de, de Dr. Hamill en français parce que je voulais vraiment qu'elle entende l'hommage qui lui... C'est sa journée. Et il m'apparaissait important qu'elle puisse comprendre l'hommage qui lui est destiné. Alors, j'espère que vous saurez pardonner ou comprendre mon choix. In recent years, we often seen colleagues presenting the recipient of the mural driver in a very friendly manner, describing with humor and warmth the colleague they work with and they loved. I do not have the privilege of working closely with Dr. Wally Amel, like some of you may have, either at UBC or in Saskatchewan. And I look, I look at you with envy. I think you're very lucky. As you, as you all know, the Mural Driver Commemorative Lecture is presented to an exceptional occupational therapist who has made outstanding contribution to research, teaching, practice in, in occupational therapy. And at each conference, many of us, including myself, look forward to this lecture. We often perceive it as an opportunity for us to pause, to reflect on current and emergent issues that shape our profession, and to think of how we want to move forward collectively. It is a precious moment for us to reflect on the status and the growth of our profession, to examine how we could change and transform our practices, or how we could promote enablement and social particip participation for all members of our communities. We are often challenged 
to re-examine what we take for granted or maybe envision future direction. It is a daunting exercise. And as I was thinking of who could do this exercise, well, the only th person I could think of was, of course, Dr. Karen Wally Amel. So just imagine how I was in my kitchen, in my kitchen, at my kitchen table, wondering if I would dare to write to someone I don't know, but I've read so much about. And how, how could I ever invite her to such a daunting exercise? As much as it was awkward as an initiative to do, it was also a very moving human experience for both of us, I think. In this process, I was, I was hoping that I would be able to shed light on the remarkable contribution of um, this esteemed colleague of us. Like many other occupational therapists around the world, her work has singularly influenced, if not Mark, my own thinking about who we are as occupational therapists, what we do, and what we can offer. Throughout, and maybe because of our personal and professional experiences, Dr. Kerry Wally Amel demonstrating, oh, am I gone? Okay, I'm back. <laughs> demonstrating an unwavering commitment to improve the quality of life of people living with sp spinal injury to support and consolidate their social network and ultimately advocate for their social and community integration. But it was only the starting point. She has challenged us throughout the years to reconsider how our perspective on disability, client centeredness, power, oppression, participation, spirituality, occupations, well-being, cultural imperialism, uh, ableism, occupational justice, how we, were, how we were framing those concepts and how we should reconsider them. These are very soft and light topics. <laughs> Throughout our publication and our lecture, Dr. Wally Amo took a stand and advocated in her own unique way for a more human and value-based practice that would truly support well-being, enable participation, and respond to occupational rights. Through her ex exemplary richness and the depth of her intellectual approach, she deeply influenced the teaching, the research, the theory, and the practice of occupational therapy. Many occupational therapists around the world would attest how they, were been, how they have been touched, stimulated, or inspired by her work. The quality and the rigor of Dr. Wally Amel's work transcend our boundaries, as evidenced by the number of times she has been inv invited as a, as a speaker in major or international events, and the number of awards she received. Dr. Wally Amel described herself in quite a few in instances as a writer. She indeed knows the power of words. But for me, she's far more than a writer. She exemplifies what is a critical thinker, and she urges us to engage into critical reflexivity. She challenged so many times our assumption in our discourses. She untiredly underlined what action needed to be, were needed to be true to our own words. Our erudition, our insight, our keen intelligence, our obstinate refusal to abdicate in the face of social inequities, prompt us to deepen our vision of occupational therapy. She reminds us of the important contribution of occupation to well-being and our responsibilities towards the disenfranchised and marginalized population we serve. No one knows, like Dr. Wally Hamill, how to stimulate our thinking, how to underpin our conceptual foundation. She has this unique way of making us feel proud of being occupational therapists and valuing occupation. We might be challenged by our words this afternoon, but I, can, I cannot think of a more inspiring person than her to lead her to that, that journey of critical reflection. So please join me in play, paying tribute to an exceptional woman and colleague and in expressing our de deep gratitude for a, rem rem a remarkable contribution to our profession, to society, and to the shaping of how we envision the world. Please join me applaud Dr. Karen Waliamo.
you so much. To be honored with the Muriel Driver Memorial Lectureship Award was a privilege that I never envisioned nor anticipated. This has been one of the most astonishing and momentous occurrences of my life, and I am so very grateful to the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists Awards Committee and the Board of Directors for granting me this incredible honor. I especially want to acknowledge my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Catherine Vallée, who nominated me in French and before we had even met and who worked so hard to advance this nomination. Merci beaucoup, Catherine. Je suis réellement reconnaissante de votre soutien dévoué au contenu de mes publications et de l'honneur qui m'a été accordé grâce à ta intervention et support. Et pardon mon français, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> Last year, at the awards ceremony in Banff, I was given the anthology of Muriel Driver Memorial Lectures and encouraged to read the presentations given by my awesome predecessors. There were 37 lectures and they made for fascinating reading. But I was particularly struck by the words of Geraldine Moore, the original editor of the anthology, who stated in the foreword, we trust that future lectures will continue the tradition of generating critical thinking and fresh perspectives. I aspire to continue this tradition. Indeed, generating critical thinking and fresh perspectives encapsulates the overall aim of my work during the past two decades. Because I believe that critical thinking is essential to inform evidence-driven, socially relevant, and culturally safe occupational therapy practices research, theories, and education. I'd like to examine briefly the concept of critical thinking and its importance to fresh perspectives before I outline the intent of this lecture. The term critical is not employed by theorists as a pseudonym for criticism, but refers to an intellectually engaged process of seeking both to evaluate the merits of various assertions or evidence and to appraise the ideological and structural contexts in which these assertions or evidence derived. Thinking that is critical requires willingness to identify, examine, and challenge assumptions and their underlying ideologies, to contest taken for granted knowledge that is assumed to be or that is presented as true, and to value diverse forms and sources of knowledge. Philosophers contend that without critical thinking, each person becomes unconsciously integrated into an existing system, inevitably conforming to the ideas and practices that perpetuate the status quo. Critical thinkers seek to challenge the status quo, to expose the inequitable forces that reinforce the status quo, and to contest the ways in which the status quo unfairly benefits certain social groups while disadvantaging others. Thus, critical thinking can generate fresh perspectives that stimulate innovative, socially just practices. The theme chosen for this conference, honoring our past, shaping our future, provides an appropriate context for my lecture, which highlights an important question posed by Prince Edward Island's Dr. Elizabeth Townsend in the 1993 Mem uh, Muriel Driver Memorial Lecture. Why is occupational therapy important to society? In my own lecture, I intend to revisit this question to consider how we might shape the future of occupational therapy to become more important to society. I shall therefore focus on human well-being on the contribution of occupational engagement to well-being, and thus on the right to equitable occupational opportunities and choices. I shall begin by considering occupation, our central domain of concern, by thinking critically about the boundaries constructed by occupational therapy's dominant depiction of occupation, and about the consequences of preserving these boundaries. 
Occupational therapists have generated numerous definitions of occupation, some of which are lengthy, some convoluted, and some prescriptive. I use the World Federation of Occupational Therapists' definition of occupation to refer to the things that people do in their everyday lives. Dominant occupational therapy models portray all occupations, the everyday things that people do, as divisible into three specific categories of self-care work and play, or self-care productivity and leisure. I wish to honor our past by acknowledging the important contribution of the occupational performance model, which in the early 1980s delineated these three categories of occupation, and which invigorated our profession to expand its habitual focus on self-care and work to consider various productive and leisure occupations that may have value in people's lives. But visionary ideas can morph into rigid dogmas. And more than 30 years later, I am among those who were troubled by the apparent premise that these three categories encompass the only forms or purposes of occupation that are valued by human beings of importance to human well-being and of relevance to occupational therapists. I support the contentions of critics who consider these categories to be non-empirical, simplistic and individualistic, value-laden and culturally specific, artificially restrictive and culturally unsafe. I am very concerned that the imbalance of power Within, within the international occupational therapy profession leads to these categories being promoted in global contexts as if they are somehow correct. And I concur with the premise that these categories, which convey little about the relationship between occupation and human well-being, constitute professional boundaries that need to be broken. I also contend that the boundaries constructed and maintained by our profession's ongoing preoccupation with self-care productive and leisure occupations have had detrimental consequences. Distracting occupational therapists from focusing clearly on the relationship between occupation and human well-being, and from articulating and demonstrating the social importance and value of a profession dedicated to enhancing well-being through occupational engagement. Moreover, by naming occupational therapy's domain of concern as being the enablement of individuals' self-care, productive, and leisure occupations, our profession has effectively obscured the importance to human well-being of experiencing belonging through engagement in interdependent, collective, collaborative, and co-occupations, occupations undertaken with others, and we should not underestimate how important this is. A significant body of research demonstrates that doing occupations with others strengthens relationships, enhances well-being, and can help mitigate the negative health effects of stressful life events. A recent social work text stated that simply doing meaningful things with others constitutes the core of the social work profession's efforts to promote health and well-being in people's everyday lives and community functioning. So it is surely bewildering that a profession centrally concerned with doing meaningful things, such as occupational therapy, could have failed to emphasize this important dimension of human well-being in our dominant conceptual models, a dimension that is a primary motivator of occupational engagement for many of the world's people. Acknowledging the problems inherent in dominant systems of categorization, some scholars have been suggesting for more than a decade that occupations could usefully be conceptualized in terms of the meanings or qualities of experience described by those engaged in occupation, rather than as encapsulated categories of self-care, productivity, and leisure, delineated by white, anglophone, middle-class urban theorists. However, 
Due to the overwhelming dominance and hegemony of the North American tripartite categorizations of occupation, this idea has not borne much fruit. And I'm suggesting that it might be helpful to take a fresh perspective and to turn this equation around. I propose that we might instead identify the qualities of meaningful living that are valued contributors to human well-being and then inquire as to which occupations fulfill these dimensions of value for this person, this group, or this community. Perhaps we might explore the outcomes that people value and that contribute to their well-being and then consider how these needs or valued dimensions of well-being might be met through their occupational engagement. An inquiry of this nature needs to be undertaken cautiously. Critics have challenged dominant occupational therapy theories and models that portray Western theorists' perspectives as being somehow universal, as shared by everyone, everywhere, and have argued that theories ought to incorporate multiple worldviews and values if they are to be relevant and inclusive, rather than irrelevant, ethnocentric, and potentially culturally unsafe. With this proviso firmly in mind, I've explored philosophical and research literatures from around the world, from a diversity of academic disciplines and diverse peoples, and I've identified several important contributors to human well-being, which I shall outline briefly. This should not be considered a definitive or prescriptive list, but an evidence-informed set of well-being needs that might help advance a dialogue about future occupational therapy research priorities and possibilities. Clearly, the most basic well-being need is to take care of oneself through sourcing clean water and food, preparing food and eating, and accessing shelter and sanitation, and the daily occupations of a vast number of the world's people are dictated by the struggle required to try to meet these needs, including many in Canada. But taking care of oneself also demands attention to hygiene, to rest and restoration, and perhaps to routines, rituals, or specific cultural or spiritual practices that contribute to emotional self-care. Taking care of oneself is an essentially occupational endeavor which may be accomplished through the help of others. Additionally, the literature points to other important well-being needs. The need to experience a sense of belonging and connectedness to families, friends, and communities, perhaps also to the natural world, to cultural and spiritual traditions, ancestors and ancestral lands, and the intrinsic need and responsibility to care for and contribute to the well-being of these others. The need to experience a sense of self-worth and positive identity through feeling valued and valuable, capable and competent, responsible and respected. The need for both the ability and opportunity to experience and express pleasure, purpose and meaning in life through engagement in roles and accomplishment of occupations that are individually and or collectively valuable. The need for both the ability and opportunity to express choices and to experience control and empowerment in enacting one's choices. And the need for sense of hope and coherence through perceiving the possible continuity of one's valued roles and the possibility of experiencing meaningful occupational engagement in the future. It makes sense that these factors overlap with valued components of participation that have been identified by people in their everyday lives, and that they also resonate with the understanding of recovery promoted within the field of mental health, which is said to be a process of living a hopeful, satisfying, meaningful, purposeful and contributing life within the limitations caused by one's illness. Because a wealth of cross-disciplinary research indicates that each of these valued contributors to well-being 
may be engendered, experienced, and expressed through occupation, I am convinced of the centrality of occupational engagement to human well-being, and thus of the potential social relevance, value, and importance of occupational therapy. Of course, I'm not alone in these beliefs. The World Federation of Occupational Therapists has stated that occupational therapy is concerned with promoting health and well-being through occupation. Occupational therapists have a long tradition of striving to enhance physical and cognitive functions and mental health so that people can engage more effectively in certain occupations, notably self-care tasks and paid employment. But the World Federation reversed this equation, exhorting its global members to promote health and well-being through occupation, congruent with the foundational philosophy of occupational therapy. I believe that this should not be viewed as an appeal for occupational therapy interventions that simply employ specific occupation-based practices for specific individuals, but as a call for deliberate strategies that foster and facilitate the abilities and equitable opportunities of all people to engage in occupations that promote well-being. Importantly, when the World Federation of Occupational Therapists declared that occupational therapy is concerned with promoting health and well-being through occupation, no boundaries were placed upon the categories of people whose health and well-being ought to be of concern to our profession. It was stated clearly that the primary goal of occupational therapy is to enable people to participate in occupation. The WUFAT did not limit our mandate to disabled people's participation or to people with mental illnesses' participation, but asserted that occupational therapy's primary concern is with people's participation in occupation. Indeed, WUFAT declared that occupational therapists can work with all people who are restricted in their participation or who are socially excluded. Many people who experience serious and persistent mental illness also experience unemployment, social isolation, and a sense of having low self-worth due to the impact of poverty, stigma, social exclusion, and discrimination. So in several communities across Canada, occupational therapists have collaborated with mental health service users to develop occupation-based programs in safe and supportive social environments that foster a sense of belonging and of self-worth, that promote engagement in meaningful and purposeful occupations that are valued by and chosen by participants and that generate hope and contribute to the wider community. But many people who do not experience mental illness also endure unemployment, social isolation, marginalization, and a sense of having low self-worth due to poverty, stigma, social exclusion, and discrimination. Moreover, an extensive literature base supports my contention that occupational engagement is fundamentally important to the well-being of all people, not solely those whose health is already compromised. For example, many elderly people experience social isolation which is a risk factor for dementia, depression, stroke, coronary heart disease, and mortality. But researchers have demonstrated that social isolation can be overcome through occupational engagement. A large group of elderly African-American men and women who were living in conditions of social disadvantage in Maryland and considered to be at risk for social isolation were invited to participate with reading and literacy programs in their local schools. Several months later, the children's educational outcomes had improved significantly, but this was only part of the equation. The social resources of the elderly volunteers had also increased significantly, but so had their physical activity, their strength and cognitive abilities. And over a period of eight months, falls among the volunteers decreased an astonishing 
whereas they increased 10 to 13% in the control group. Notably, the volunteers appreciated the opportunity to give back or contribute in a meaningful way to their communities. This study is one among many demonstrating that well-being among healthy seniors can be promoted through meaningful occupational engagement that promotes self-worth, a sense of purpose and meaning, that enables choice and the opportunity to contribute, and that fosters hope. A profession that committed to creating opportunities for well-being programs such as these would clearly be of importance, value, and relevance to society. And there are so many more examples. In the downtown east side of Vancouver, a network of urban farms located on reclaimed land employ people who are struggling with mental illnesses, addictions, poverty, and homelessness. And these farms produce over 25 tons of fruit and vegetables a year. Founded by a farmer who believes in the value of rehabilitation through meaningful work, the farm's products supply 30 area restaurants, five farmers markets, and several community kitchens. Through the opportunity to engage in meaningful and purposeful occupation within a safe, supportive, and natural environment, the workers experience significantly improved well-being, including a positive sense of identity and self-worth, the satisfaction of contributing something of value to others, a sense of belonging and hope, a path that fosters recovery. In Australia, a growing body of evidence concerning the men's shed movement, which creates places specifically for meaningful occupation and mateship, supports the value of providing opportunities for well-being through occupational engagement. Collaborative participation in occupations such as woodwork is reported to foster self-esteem, a sense of belonging, meaning, and purpose, and hope among older men and the at-risk youth they mentor. And in Iceland, a nationwide commitment to providing teens with opportunities to, to develop healthy coping abilities through almost daily engagement in martial arts, dance, sport, artistic or musical occupations, and that specifically encourages occupations undertaken with parents has resulted in plummeting levels of drug and alcohol abuse and smoking among young people. Surely, a profession that committed to creating opportunities for well-being programs such as these would be of importance, value, and relevance to society. It is pertinent to acknowledge that occupational engagement is not inevitably positive. Occupations may be experienced as dehumanizing, degrading, demeaning, boring, humiliating, and frustrating. Moreover, occupations may be illegal and can have a negative impact on well-being. People's occupational choices may jeopardize both their own health, freedom, and survival, and the health, freedom, and survival of others and the environment. And many people lack the capability to choose not to engage in occupations that imperil their health, well-being, and survival. But although occupational engagement is not inherently positive, I contend that if well-being can be enhanced by people's engagement in occupations that fulfill their needs and accord with their values, then occupational therapy could make an enormous contribution to society by applying our special knowledge and skills to help increase the opportunities available for people to achieve well-being through occupational engagement, and especially for all those disadvantaged, marginalized, and vulnerable people whose occupational opportunities are inequitably constrained by the structural factors that shape their lives. Fifty years of research have conclusively demonstrated that traumatic life events and chronic or enduring stresses such as poverty, conflict, discrimination, and childhood traumas exert damaging impacts on physical and mental health, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, anxiety, depression, PTSD, 
and alcohol and substance misuse disorders. This research also demonstrates that exposure to stress is unequally distributed within society, such that people who are the most disadvantaged experience the most stress and the most negative impacts on their physical and psychological well-being, and that these stresses proliferate and reproduce disadvantage from one generation to the next. But this research has also revealed three particularly efficacious stress buffers, a sense of control over one's everyday life, a sense of self-esteem and of being a valued and competent person, and a sense of belonging within a network of social support that mediate the damaging impacts of exposure to stressful experiences. And because these stress buffers may be enhanced through occupational engagement, and especially through occupational engagement with others, our profession's social importance and relevance could be demonstrated by our commitment to working to foster opportunities to achieve well-being through occupation with populations experiencing significant life stresses, refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants, homeless people and prisoners, at-risk children and street-involved youth, as well as with healthy seniors, very elderly people and others at risk for social isolation with transgendered people in transition and others experiencing disruptive life transitions, such as from work to retirement, from home to a care home, or from military deployment to civilian life. We surely have a valuable role with those whose lives have been disrupted, not only by illness or injury, but by tragedy or bereavement, loss or disaster, forced migration, ecological degradation or the impacts of climate change, or who have experienced such traumas as cultural dislocation, domestic violence, terrorism, sex, sex trafficking, or torture. It is inspiring to witness the work of a few occupational therapists in emergent areas of practice such as these, but there is so much more our profession might accomplish notably by advancing the right to occupational engagement. The World Federation of Occupational Therapists has declared the imperative of ensuring equitable opportunities for participation in occupation, regardless of difference, and has claimed that all persons, by virtue of being human, have the right to occupational opportunities necessary to meet human needs access human rights and maintain health. The right to opportunity also underpins the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, to which Canada is a signatory, which aspires to promote, protect and ensure equality of opportunity, full and effective participation in society and access on an equal basis with others to every facility and service provided to the public, both in urban and rural areas. It is 2017, and yet within Canada, across the world and in almost every community, disabled people experience unequal access to participate in the places, spaces, services, opportunities, and ordinary lives of their communities, especially in rural areas. And of course, this inevitably implies that those of us who are not disabled are the beneficiaries of our unequal and inequitable access to places, spaces, choices, and opportunities. In Canada, researchers have documented the inequitable social participation experienced by many disabled people, their limited occupational opportunities their diminished choices and lack of control over their own lives. But the experience of limited opportunity and disempowerment is not unique to disabled people. Within Canada and around the world, opportunities for social participation are inequitably distributed among people of different socioeconomic classes, 
genders, races, ethnicities, ages, abilities, sexualities, citizenship statuses, and experiences of colonialism. Engagement in living through occupational participation is a determinant of health, and the degree to which people have control over their lives and opportunities to participate fully in society are powerful determinants not only of their health and well-being, but of the quality of life and their length of life. Epidemiologists therefore contend that efforts at health promotion can only be effective if they focus not simply on biology and behavior, but on the inequitable social structures that determine the unfair distribution of occupational opportunities and choices. Earlier, I identified the importance to human well-being of in formulating choices and of experiencing the required degree of control over one's life circumstances to enact these choices. Occupational therapist theoretical tradition maintains that individuals choose, shape, and orchestrate their everyday occupations, as if choice is simply a consequence of individual volition. But this is a uniquely privileged and culturally specific viewpoint. Perhaps in North America, some individuals make choices about what they do, informed solely by their own volition, will, and individual self-interests and perhaps they orchestrate these occupational choices in their everyday lives. But for many of the world's people, choices are made within couples, families and communities, either cooperatively and collaboratively, or as a consequence of coercion. Moreover, people do not have equal choices to act, and the inequitable choices and life opportunities available to individuals and entire communities are severely constrained by religious and patriarchal cultural traditions and by the social determinants of everyday lives, such as poverty, racism, colonialism, violence, low literacy, inequitable access to education, to transportation and technology, unemployment, unstable housing and food insecurity. Indeed, even when an expanded range of occupational opportunities becomes available, internalized expectations arising from entrenched social inequalities may continue to limit the choices that people can envision as possible for themselves. Informed by evidence that control over life circumstances and full social engagement and participation in what society has to offer are distributed unequally, and that as a result, health is distributed unequally. Health authorities across Canada are beginning to recognize the need to address the non-medical or social determinants of health. Occupational therapy has traditionally been concerned with enabling abilities and facilitating functions, and this is important work. But our profession has been less concerned with the occupational opportunities that are available or unavailable due to the inequitable conditions of people's lives. Our client-centered thinking rarely extends beyond dimensions of an individual's local environment to consider how social structures, norms, and policies influence and determine the opportunities for occupational participation, not solely for individuals, but for families, groups, and populations. A critical perspective would suggest that this narrowness of vision is the inevitable consequence of our profession's positioning within a Western neoliberal ideological context that promotes managerialism with its attendant numeric outcome measures and its preference for assessments over interventions, that prizes self-reliance and individualism extols independence and self-determination, and blames people for their ill health and social problems, an ideology that has left its indelible imprint on our theories and practices. Philosophers and economists claim that if people's abilities are constrained by their available opportunities, they will be unable to achieve well-being. 
And if well-being is dependent upon opportunities for occupational engagement, as evidence suggests, then occupational therapists must respond to the systemic disadvantages and structural inequities that frame occupational choices and constrain occupational opportunities. Contrary to neoliberal ideology, public health researchers contend that health behaviours and actions are not simply the product of individual choice, but the consequence of social contexts that confer unequal life chances and of social determinants that create barriers to choice. Thus, significant changes in levels of human well-being cannot be accomplished by focusing solely on enhancing physical abilities, teaching lifestyle changes, self-management programs, mindfulness, or other behavioral or cognitive modifications, without also attending to the impacts of social structures on people's opportunities for achieving well-being. We need to consider what is available for people to do with the abilities they have their capabilities, because the societal importance of occupational therapy is unlikely to be realized or recognized if we mistake abilities for capabilities and fail to address what people actually have the opportunity to do. Moreover, it is not enough for occupational therapists simply to identify structural conditions and inequalities that constrain people's opportunities and to stick the label occupational in front, such that we assemble and claim ownership of an ever-expanding list of occupational injustices and occupational inequities. Clearly, an injustice exists whenever people's occupational rights are violated and wherever opportunities are inequitably constrained. We have been labeling occupational injustices for over a decade. It is time for occupational therapists to address occupa occupational injustices. Our profession is well positioned to advocate and to work with advocates and activists, community workers, policy makers, planners, lawyers and others towards creating equitable opportunities for all people to enhance their well-being through occupation. Well-being is a fundamental entitlement within international conventions on human rights, and it has been asserted that all people have the inherent right to engage in occupations that contribute positively to their well-being throughout their lives. Importantly, the recently revised Woofert Minimum Standards for Education now require a specific focus on human rights. But is this bold standpoint on rights evident within Canadian occupational therapy discourse? I always study the abstracts of the papers and posters to be presented at the annual conference of the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists and was intrigued last year by the abstract of Emily Singh Yee Chai and Gregor Waldring. Informed by the belief that the public does not understand the role of occupational therapists, and by their perception that newspapers shape public opinion. These researchers examined how occupational therapy is framed in Canadian newspapers. Their results were reported as follows. Occupational therapy was portrayed mostly through a medical lens. The newspapers missed contemporary shifts in occupational therapy, such as the increased engagement with occupational justice, enablement and disability studies and failed to portray the societal importance of occupational therapy. I was fascinated by this exciting and innovative study, but I was concerned that I also had missed all these important contemporary shifts in occupational therapy. And I was intrigued by the researchers' claim that occupational therapy has expanded from its original medical scope to interrogate the social disablement one faces in gaining and keeping an occupation. To test this assumption, I undertook an analysis of all the abstracts of the papers and posters accepted for the 2016 conference to determine whether our profession's self-perceived social focus and societal importance were evident in our own discourse. My analysis was confined to the approximately 350 abstracts written in English 
and my results were sobering. The overwhelming majority of abstracts that concerned occupational therapy practices addressed screening or interventions for individuals who were categorized according to specific medical diagnoses and described deficits. They described or promoted specific assessment tools or discussed occupational therapy in defined clinical settings such as intensive care units. Only nine abstracts addressed our profession's engagement with issues of justice. Only two mentioned disability studies and just two appeared to address the societal importance of occupational therapy. It was profoundly discouraging to discover only one paper that explored occupational therapy with indigenous people who were more likely than other Canadians to be disabled, disenfranchised and living in poverty and whose services and opportunities fall below the already dismal standard experienced by many other disabled Canadians. I understand, of course, that only a subset of submitted abstracts are accepted by the scientific committee and therefore published in the proceedings. However, I believe my overall conclusion is merited. That occupational therapy in Canada has yet to expand from its individualistic impairment-based medical scope to interrogate the social disadvantages that constrain so many people in gaining and maintaining occupational participation. Most notably, the significant social disadvantages experienced by indigenous people do not appear to be a pressing concern for occupational therapists in Canada, despite our knowledge that within colonized and settler countries such as Canada, indigenous people experience significantly more social disadvantages, diminished well-being and ill health than non-indigenous people. If the ideas we choose to share or that are selected for presentation at our annual conferences reflect our priorities and our sense of urgency, it would seem that our Canadian profession has yet to embrace a form of practice that focuses not solely on people's functions and abilities, but on their well-being and on their capabilities, their opportunities to do what they have the abilities to do. Moreover, we appear to be out of step with Woofert's explicit principle of advocating for human rights across all areas of practice, a principle that requires us to reflect on the nature not solely of our practices, but of the assessments we use to inform and appraise our practices. Earlier this year, health ministers from the member countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development met to determine how healthcare outcomes ought to be assessed. They agreed that measures of clinical indicators are inadequate and what people really care about is the impact of healthcare on their well-being, their ability to participate in meaningful activities, participate in society, avoid loneliness, and have a sense of control over their everyday lives. Accordingly, the OECD health ministers declared that these are the outcomes that should be measured to determine the real impact of healthcare. This was a significant declaration. And of course, occupational therapists already knew that the recovery of a meaningful life is more important than the recovery of physical function. Clearly, occupational therapists have the knowledge and skills to make an important and valuable contribution to human well being, to healthcare, and to society. However, I believe we are unlikely to be seen as knowledgeable about the outcomes that matter to patients unless we commit to developing and consistently using assessments and outcome measures focused unambiguously on what matters to people, their well-being and their occupational engagement in living. And by appraising environmental resources and structural constraints, in addition, to individuals, abilities, and resources. Moreover, I believe we are unlikely to attract more funding or to open up more employment opportunities 
if we continue to depict our profession's principal concern as being the enablement of self-care, productive and leisure occupations, instead of clearly articulating the links between occupational engagement and well-being, between well-being and human rights, and our potential contribution to promoting the right to well-being through occupation. This lecture has pondered how we might shape the future of occupational therapy to become more important to society. I have argued that occupational engagement is fundamentally important to human well-being, that well-being is a human right, and that all people have the inherent right to engage in occupations that contribute positively to their own well-being and the well-being of their communities. I have proposed that occupational therapy's unique contribution lies in our capacity to foster well-being through occupational engagement. And I have identified some key contributors to well-being that may be met through occupation. Additionally, I have argued that occupational therapy's importance and value to society will be manifested when we extend our focus beyond enhancing the abilities of individuals whose lives are already impacted by illness, injury, or impairment, and commit to equalizing opportunities for the achievement of well-being through occupational engagement of all those whose occupational rights are inequitably constrained. The World Federation of Occupational Therapists has declared that occupational therapy contributes to the global health of society and individuals by enabling the right to engage in meaningful, purposeful occupations, irrespective of medical diagnosis, social stigma or prejudice, a pronouncement I regard as aspirational. The theme underpinning this conference encourages us to consider the future shape of our profession. I have already alluded to the importance of hope to human well-being, and I hope for a future in which occupational therapy is recognized as being a socially important and socially relevant profession, valued for its commitment to ensuring that all people have opportunities to participate in occupations that contribute positively to their well-being and the well-being of their communities, as is their right. Our profession is important and our future can be bright. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wally Hamill. I believe that Geraldine Moore would agree that you have more than fulfilled her wish that future lectures would generate critical thinking and fresh perspectives. You are a true leader in our profession and a critical voice to help us change the boundaries that we've set in our past and to push us forward in our future. The Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists is pleased to honor you, the 39th Muriel Driver Memorial, Memorial Lecturer, with this beautiful plate. Mm. I'm so scared I'm going to drop it. <laughs> I'm happy to hand so it over. It. Yes. <laughs> Your name has been engraved alongside the other distinguished recipients. It comes with our sincere thanks and deep appreciation. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this year's memorial. 
Muriel Driver Memorial Lecture and being such a wonderful and attentive audience. Merci à tous pour vous être joint à nous pour le discours commémoratif Muriel Driver et pour avoir été un pu public si merveilleux et attentif. At 2.30, coffee will be available in the exhibit hall at the conference center. And later this evening is our PEI kitchen party. I know that I will see some of you there. Make sure you arrive hungry and enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>